Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews, uh, James chapter 3. Now, last week we were in chapter 2, and we covered that difficult section where it looks like he's saying that you have to have works to be saved, to be justified. And if you think that justify means to be saved from hell, that'll be a very difficult passage. Now, I just want to make a few remarks about that yet. I was listening to Mike today, and I, I uh, copied a, or wrote down a quote from him, and he says, Faith and works together don't equal, equal some efficacious act. In other words, faith and works won't save you. So let's be clear on that. Faith and works won't save you. He says, but faith alone saves but it's a kind of faith that saves, that is going to issue in works. And that's what I was trying to say last week, but not in such a concise way. In other words, you can test out the faith, the profession that one makes, as to whether or not he has faith. You can test it out with his works. You know. See, if you believe that Christ died for you, and that it's by His shed blood that you're saved. And all you have to do is just believe that. You experience the salvation, the freedom, and the peace, and the joy that comes from that. You're saved at the, right at that moment, right? You're saved with not a single work on your part. If that has happened to you, that faith will evidence itself in works. Now that's very different from you saying, well, I'm going to try and add works to my faith in order to get saved. That's not, that's not what we're saying. That's not what James is saying. Let's back up to chapter 1 and get a little bit more, maybe a little more of a taste or an uh, overview of what he is saying. In chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So right away, from the beginning, we can see that He's already assuming we have faith. That we are already Christians. This is not talking about how to get saved, how to become born again, or become a Christian. If you want to get uh, teaching on that, you have to go to Romans, and Hebrews, Ephesians, Colossians, especially Romans. Really, Romans is the place. Remember Romans says, but he that worketh not, but believeth. No work. And actually, it doesn't say, it doesn't even stay neutral about whether you should work or not. It has an, he has an opinion whether you should work or not to get saved. He says, work not. Work not and believe. That'll get you saved, justified. But then here in James, we find out what that faith is supposed to act like. The outworkings of faith. The trying of your faith worketh. Look at the word work. In other words, there's now a process going on in you. It's working something. Working patience in you. And then it says in verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Notice again, it doesn't say that ye may be saved, but that ye may be perfect. In other words, your faith will reach its highest point. It will reach its ultimate goal as you face temptations and count them all joy and let patience work its, uh, its full work in you. And then, so, let me see my notes here. So you, you understand that salvation is not about God working in you, right? It's what God worked in Christ 2,000 years ago. That is the basis for justification, getting saved. So, this working in you, that's after you're saved. It has nothing to do with salvation. You see, if you take the... Uh, let's, let's say you take the 10 seconds of the best moments in your life, even after you were saved. Let's take the 10 seconds, a second here and a second there, and compress them together to, let's say, 10 seconds or one minute or something. You take that one minute, say, okay, God, is this one minute good enough to get me saved? 
it would absolutely not be good enough. There's just absolutely nothing in us that, can God, that God can look at and say, that is good enough to get you to heaven. Alright? So let's be clear on where our justification rests on. You see, probably the clearest, the clearest explanation of the, the Gospel is given by the, that Malcolm Smith, that book I have from him. He explains how that our relationship with God is actually a covenant. Now you understand the covenant requires two parties. There's one party over here and one over here, and they come together and they go through a ritual or some, some process. In the Old Testament, they'd have animals and they'd cut those animals in two and they'd, and they'd put one half of the animal on one side of the path and another part of the other half of the animal over here and you walk through the middle of those two halves and there's a, it's called the blood, path, the blood path. You walk through that path, one party walks through and that party understands that the expression here is, if I back out on my side of this covenant, let it be done to me what happened to these animals. And the other party, the other side of the covenant walks through that path, the same thing. If I don't keep up my side of this relationship, this covenant, let it be done to me what happened to these animals. Let me, ki let me be killed and my body is thrown to the scavengers, basically. So that's the kind of, that's the covenant we're talking about. It's not just a contract that you can sign a name and then you back out and maybe be sued or something, but this is life and death. So, now, <clears throat> Jesus, okay, a whole tribe could go into a covenant with another tribe. But they wouldn't all have to walk through that blood path. They would just pick out a representative. One man to represent each side. And they, only those two would go through there. And when they went through there, it was counted as if the whole tribe went through. Okay? So what we have then in the Gospel is that Jesus is our representative on our side. He represents the man's side. So God goes through and then Jesus goes through as us and for us. And so He guarantees our side of the covenant. He keeps it for us. So you understand that, that it's not like God is over here and I am over here on this side with faith. Just me and my little faith over here. So my relationship is not just directly between me and God. Over here on the man's side is Jesus. And over here on the God's side is the Father. And Jesus is, is the guarantee on my side. So I have a man that God looks at, and I'm in that man. You understand the difference? God doesn't look at me and say, Do, does, does Moses have enough faith? I see I wouldn't, have any, I wouldn't have any faith at all if there wasn't a man on my side. So I have a righteous man that is has fully lived the law, fully kept the, the human side of the covenant. And then God can say, okay, that man is righteous. And He went through the death, burial, and resurrection on my side or the human side of the relationship and brought us with Him from our sin, our rebellion, and our death through the cross, through death, and over the other side, over to God. So we have been united to God. And we see that in Colossians 1.20. It says in and you that were sometime alienated, you were separated, yet now hath He, Jesus, reconciled in the body of His flesh through death. He's brought us over to God. He did it. He did what we could not do. So I just believe that. My salvation doesn't even... I think I can say it this way. My salvation doesn't even rest on my faith. It rests on Jesus and His blood. And I just believe that. Now when you see that, and you rest in what He did for you, as the perfect man on your behalf, the perfect representative that walked through the, the blood, and went through the cross and over the other side, when you see that, and you rest in that, you begin to rejoice. The burden rolls off your shoulder. There's nothing left for you to do. He did it all. Just like David, he conquered Goliath on behalf of the, the nation of Israel. And 
you could see they understood that a whole nation could be wrapped up in one man so when that one man conquered the other side the whole nation was in the victory on the victory even the ladies at the women at home were dancing and singing david has slain his thousand or his 10,000 or whatever we just sing the song of what jesus accomplished on our behalf we rejoice in that and so now if you if you get that you come to that understanding and you rest in that finished work now you got faith but that faith will get tried that faith, you will not be allowed to just stand in a neutral ground. Say, well, I'll just kind of just stand right here and, and I'll just do nothing. You will be challenged. Do you continue to believe? Because the trials of life, the false doctrines, your own flesh, the devil and the world will come against that faith and you're going to have to stand and hold on. It's like you're in the middle of a current in the river. You can't just stay neutral. You've got to set an anchor down and hold fast. So now you're working. That faith is now expressing itself in some outward action. Alright, that, that is the order. That is the understanding you need to have about this. So James is just explaining how this faith will act now that you've got it. Uh, and when it's tried, it'll work patience in you, which is faith pro uh, over a period of time. That's basically what patience is. Patience is when you have faith over a period of time. See, on the, when you got saved, you got your faith, right? But you had, didn't have patience yet. It's just the seed of faith. But then you get, get that faith tried and then now you have patience because you stood the test. You stood against the... Uh, uh, the trials of life, and counted it all joy. Now, let's go to chapter 3, and we will see some, uh, a continuation of what he's been talking about. Um, let me see if I'm missing something. Oh, I wanted to say also that one of the first things is that will manifest as an outworking of your faith is what you say and what you do. Notice there in chapter 1, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Slow to speak. That is the proper response to trials, is to be slow to speak and slow to wrath. Isn't that one of the first things we do instead of counting it all joy is we get angry. Or we are tempted to get angry. And the more I'm studying James, I'm finding out that it has to do with your neighbor, your brothers. Love your neighbor as yourself. Have, don't hold your faith with respect to persons. In other words, your faith will probably get tried the most in your relationships. All right. And what is it if somebody does something against you that hurts you or something? Isn't the first response that we is always isn't it in words? We get all fired up and we start talking about it. We repeat it, we pass on the gossip and we we're not slow to speak, quick to hear and slow to speak. You know, I think we're supposed to be quick to hear is this gossip and if it's gossip you don't listen to it and you don't don't repeat it. I think that's what he means when he says be slow, be quick to hear. Discern what you're listening to and then don't repeat it, don't talk about it and in just a form of gossip. You understand the, the proper... doesn't mean we can't address it and things like that. But be slow to, slow to speak. Discern a little bit. Are you just passing on gossip or... Uh, are you giving in to these negative waves of the sea? Are you getting tossed to and fro by this, uh, this brother or this neighbor that is treating you wrong? Trying your faith. Alright, chapter 3. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. 
All right? Don't aspire, don't have a lot of people aspire to a leadership position and be teaching and, and be, the, be kind of like a boss. Don't try to be a big shot and, and tell others how to live. Now, in Timothy, over in Timothy, Paul said, if any of you want to be a bishop, he that desires an office of a bishop, he desires a good work. So it's a good thing. But we shall receive greater condemnation. He includes himself. Greater condemnation. Uh, there in 1 Timothy 6, he also said that don't pick a novice. Don't pick a newly converted guy because he'll fall, lest he be lifted up with pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Condemnation of the devil. And I also think that maybe this condemnation is talking about the day of judgment because he says that in uh, somewhere, I got it here. Well, oh, Hebrews 13:17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. So those who are over the uh, flock, they will have to give an account of the souls that they were ministering to. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 is that passage where it talks about every man's work being tried and you're going to suffer loss or receive reward based on what sort of work that you did. And it's not talking about salvation. This is talking about rewards. Remember that verse where it says, 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he hath done. Not believe, but what he did. Whether it be good or bad. Can you imagine receiving for the bad you've done? <clears throat> you're, gonna, you're gonna suffer loss. So we're gonna have to give an account, those of us who are teachers of the word. More condemnation for those. So don't aspire to be masters, be teachers. Verse two. For in many things we offend all. So there's many different ways that we we offend everybody. <laughs> if any man offend not in this one area, in word, if you learn not to offend anybody in what you say, the same is a perfect man. Now that's, a, that's a big statement. That's saying a lot right there. In other words, he's saying if you learn not to offend in your word, then you're perfect in every area of your life. You're a perfect man. You're able also to bridle the whole body. To learn not to speak, be, to hasty in your words, and just to uh, let patience have its perfect work in you, and ask for wisdom instead of, instead of yielding to the lust of the flesh and respond negatively. Ask for wisdom, let patience have its perfect, perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire. Well, guess what? Right here we have that word perfect again. Offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. It says in 126, if you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is vain. So can you see that he's continuing the thoughts that he's already expressed in chapter 1. He's carrying it all the way through. I'm seeing everything is held together. Like the trying of your faith, the patience and the wisdom and slow to speak. He keeps bringing up those issues and broadening, broadening them and tying them together. So this idea of patience having its perfect work in you, that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing, that ties in in how you speak. If, you're, if you learn not to offend in word, you're perfect. In other words, you're letting patience have its perfect work rather than responding in impatience or in lack of faith. In counting it all joy, you let wrath work in your body. You get upset, get double-minded. All right. Remember, it says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. From above. See, you can either focus on 
the perfect gift that is from above, or you can yield to the flesh where the lust is, where the lust is operating, and, and sin is brought forth. We'll see more of that in the later in this chapter. Behold, verse 3, Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths. I think all of us know exactly what that's about. We've all had to harness the, the horses and put the bridle on and we put a bit in their mouth. That they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. So the way that you turn their whole body is not by just brute force and forcing them, pushing them around. You just put a bridle on that smaller part on their, in their mouth and you pull the mouth around, pull the head, and, you go, and the, uh, the whole body is turned. Now, I'm sure you know this, but the way you keep a horse down is you sit on his head. A horse cannot get up if he can't throw up his head. And I've heard this, if you're riding a horse, which I haven't done much, but if you, if you keep that head pulled to the side, they, won't, they can't just run off with, with you. So you can do that small work, pull the head over the side, and you govern the whole body. Well, that works. He's going to use that illustration a little bit. But before that, he also uses the illustration of a ship. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, there's the word wind again, like we saw in chapter 1, toss the wave, like a wave tossed with the wind, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, a rudder, whithersoever the governor listeth. So the governor, the guy on the ship, he says, I want to go this way. And the, the wind's blowing hard, and the fierce wind, he doesn't have to fight the wind with the whole boat. He just turns that small little rudder and the whole ship gets turned. Well, he's saying, even so, the tongue is a little, a little member. If you, if you learn to control the tongue, you can control your whole body. A little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. See, that little tongue can also do a lot of damage. How many churches have been just ravaged and destroyed because somebody didn't keep their mouth shut when they should have. They, they, they kindled, they, they said, well, it's just a small little thing I'm saying here. It's not much, it's not that bad. But just like a little spark can start a huge forest fire, so a little offensive word can start a huge damage in the church or in the business or whatever, whatever wherever you're at. Uh, he says, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You know how many thousands and thousands of acres have been burnt because one kid playing with a little fire dropped a little spark, maybe just threw a cigarette butt away and thought it's nothing, it's just a little, bit, little bitty spark. Walked away and before he knew it, 85, you know, 85 houses are burned to the ground and hundreds of thousands of acres burned to the ground or destroyed. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It's just a world that's full of iniquity. That's, that's a lot. So is the tongue among our members, for this tongue is among our members, that it defileth the whole body. You can just say some evil words and it defiles the whole body. It's interesting that it doesn't say it defiles your heart or defiles your soul. It defiles your body. See, the body is the source of lust. The body is where the lusts are in, the lusts of the flesh. And you can defile that body and then that body turns around. See, you can, you can think a dirty thought and then you speak it and then you defile that body and then that body turns around and it's become a source. Right? Your heart was the original source. You sowed it to the flesh, and now the flesh turns around, and now you're reaping from that flesh what you sowed to it. You defiled that body. 
I talked about that last yesterday at church. Defiling the whole body, and it setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. What I see there is that the same destruction that is going on in hell right now, at the moment we're speaking, that destruction can be done in your body right now by the words that you speak. Somehow it's destructive to your physical body, the course of nature. It reminds me of that verse that talks about the elements of the world being dissolved by the fire that's going to come. So there's a destruction going on. The, maybe it's like the atoms falling apart, you know, things are falling apart. The course of nature is being disrupted and dissolved. And somehow words have that effect. Your tongue has that destructive effect to physical bodies. I mean, I, could, I can say things to a person and, and really affect that person's body. I can set some fire. I can set a fire by the words that I speak. And then that person has to go home and deal with that. Get it back out. And not think about it and get over it and move on. And let's not do that to our brothers. Verse 7, For every kind of beast and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. So he's saying that every animal and bird and living thing in the, the ocean, man has taken those animals and tamed them. But the tongue can no man tame. <laughs> it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So we're injecting people with poison when we speak evil words. So he's got a lot of negative things to say about the tongue. He just really makes a lot of commotion about this tongue. Very destructive. Let's look at the word poison. There's a lot of verses about the poison. Romans 3.13 says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. What would happen if you took that poison and it got injected in you. You would die. It would destroy you. Well, guess what? The words that you speak out of your mouth can be just like that. It's poison. I tell you what, a lot of news today is poison. A lot of things on YouTube is poison. A lot of radio, things you listen on the radio is pure poison. And you listen to it, I mean, if I listen to it, I can feel it literally going into my stomach and just, just, just eh. the injustice, the wickedness, the evil that you see is like, man, why is this allowed to go on? And it just has this negative effect on me. Now, I'm not saying just stick your head in the sand, you know, not be aware of what's going on. But I can only handle so much and I was like, I don't want to just keep listening to that junk. It's so depressing. CNN is constant negative news. All right, uh, Psalm 140, verse 3 says, They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adders, that's a viper, adders' poison is under their lips. Okay, verse 9. Therewith bless we God. All right, so we're using our tongue to bless God. Say, Oh Lord, I praise you this morning. You go to church and you bless God, you thank Him. Then we're soon, uh, even the Father. And then church is over and says, and therewith curse we men, <laughs> which are made after the similitude of God. So, say, you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. You love God? Yeah, I love God. Yeah, bless the Lord, praise the Lord, and you're praising God, and you're, and you're sounding real religious. And then you find out later that He's just really, He's in the gossip and He's, Cursing men, and <laughs> which are and they're made in the same, you know, in the similitude of God. It says, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. All right, and then he says, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. <laughs> Interesting what he says about it. You notice he doesn't say, my brethren, if you do that, you're not saved. Or, my brethren, it's impossible. Apparently it is possible, but he says it ought not so to be. 
My brethren, these things ought not so to be. All right. Um, let's see. Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said, Bless them that curse you. You know? Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Don't let your mouth be full of cursing and bitterness. Like it says in Romans 3.14. Verse 11, Doth a fountain sent forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? So here you got an artesian well. Water is just gushing out. Do you think that, that it can gush out sweet water and bitter at the same time? You know, at the same place. Jesus said to, about the Pharisees, O generation of vipers, snakes, you know, adders, vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So your heart is like, you know, below the surface, like a well, and the water comes out of your mouth, like out of the mouth of a well. So how can you being evil, talking to non-believers, speak good things? So here we are, believers, and we're still speaking curse, you know, cursing people, saying negative things about people. You say, well, I've never cursed anybody. I never said, I curse you. <laughs> you may not have never said it like that, but you know, you can curse somebody without saying the word curse, right? <laughs> you can say, you worthless idiot, <laughs> you know? That's cursing somebody. And James is saying, hey, here you've got faith, right? You got, you've been begotten again by the Father of lights. You're light in the Lord. And you're violating that. Says, in the natural, that's impossible. All right? Verse 13, who is... No, I think I missed one. Verse 12, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? You ever walk up to a fig tree... Maybe we don't. Maybe you've never seen a fig tree. Maybe we, could under, maybe we could picture a little better walking up to an apple tree and say, hey, why are there no blackberries on here? <laughs> so what's wrong with this tree? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs? You go to a grapevine and look for figs. So, no, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Either it's fresh all the time or it's salt water all the time. Can't do both. So he's just saying, if it's true in the natural, then you act like that in the spiritual. Now I'm doing all the talking. Anybody have any ideas here? Huh? Well, maybe you're realizing that when, when James talks about faith that actually works, it drives it home to every one of us. We all realize that this is a this is this would only be a, a true believer that really has the faith in him. It's impossible for somebody to say, "Well, you say I have to have works to be saved." Let's say if somebody says that, and then they point to their their dress or to their you know not going to the wrong places and just going to the right places and keeping this day holy and, and avoiding this and avoiding that James goes way deeper than that he drives you right down to where we all realize that we've failed and if you try to to do the work that he is saying right here to get saved you'd realize you'd be lost the first day so, he indicts us all. So I'm glad that I don't have to do this to be saved because I could never pull it off. I could never watch my tongue and never offend anybody and have this perfect record of works. Well, you know what people say then. Well, we just do the best we can. We work at it and then let the grace of God fill in where we fail. No, the Bible is very clear. It's either by works and works alone and no grace or it's all grace and no works. Now we're talking about salvation here. We're talking about getting saved and, and you know, not going to hell. Now that you're saved, now, now that you got this faith, now learn to act like it. 
Express this faith with your words and your actions. Let the faith that's in your heart come out of your mouth and be a blessing to people because you've been blessed, already been blessed. Remember in uh, Romans chapter 4, it said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Man, think about that. That means that the Lord will not in the future ever again impute a single sin to your account. Now, are you going to sin as, as a Christian? Obviously, we all are aware of places that we have not lived the way we should have. I'm aware of my shortcomings every day. And if I focus on them, I get real discouraged. But then I go back and I remember that I'm not saved based on my record or my lack or whatever. I'm saved on Jesus' record and God will never impute a single sin to me because He's already imputed them to His Son. That's good news. Even when I sin, I don't say, God, please take that record off my account. It's never been to my account to begin with. The moment I got saved, my whole account has been wiped out and put on Jesus and His account is put on mine. His righteousness put on mine and God keeps that, that record straight. So now, now that I understand that, I want to live up to that. You understand that? I'm not trying to earn something here. I'm not accept rewards, maybe. That's okay to try to earn rewards, but I'm not going to try to earn my standing with God. I'm not going to try to add to what Christ has done as far as my acceptance with God goes. I just want to express this salvation. So the book of James can actually be a positive book if you understand that now that you're saved, you say, well, how, how do I live this out now? Can you give me some direction how to live the Christian life? What to do? How to respond? And so here's just James saying, okay, count it all joy. It starts with that when you fall into diverse temptations. Don't blame God and say this temptation is of God. It's your own flesh. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Don't be double-minded and get things confused about the source of the good things and the source of the bad things. Be straight with where the source is and let the, the flow from heaven come down into through and out, out your mouth. Down into your heart and then out of your mouth. Don't let the flow come from the negative, from the flesh, from the world. And then speak that out. Keep your focus and you will grow in the faith. And that faith will turn into patience, which is uh, the full expression of faith. So, look at this. Verse uh, 14. 3.14 But if you have bitter envying and strife in your heart, now well, that's the negative. That is the opposite of counting it all joy. That is the opposite of loving your neighbors yourself. That is the opposite of being slow to speak and slow to wrath. Is you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts. Glory not if you have that. Don't glory about your denomination or don't glory about your church. Wow, we got a great church. Well, let me uh, ask you something. Do you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts? Don't talk to me about your clothes that you're wearing or the lifestyle or about the, the rules that you've got. What about the issues in your heart? You want to talk about works? Let's go deeper than this outward show. What about the, the very issues in your heart? You know how many churches that have the, all the, they look so good on the outside, but they have all kinds of fightings and ending and strife going on the inside. Constantly gossiping and fighting and bickering among, about stuff. In Galatians, Paul said, Brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. See, we don't believe in rules. We don't believe in law here, right? Well, don't take that occasion, that liberty. Just go out and serve your flesh. But serve one another by love. For well, that's the fulfillment of the law. It's fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbors. Somebody says this. But if you, if you bite and devour one another, picture that. You're just, you're just biting each other and devouring them. 
just the, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. <laughs> you just might be consumed if you start eating each other. He says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There it is. And then he says, I'm Galatians uh, 5, 13 to 26 is where I'm reading. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I think a lot of people would just be horrified to think that you can have a church with no rules, no law. So how would I not get into sin if I didn't have a rule to keep me? Right here he says, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You drop down to verse 18, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. See, if a guy is walking after the Spirit, he's not thinking about, am I breaking this law? Am I breaking this law? Am I keeping this law? He's just so busy worshiping God, walking after the Spirit, got the joy of the Lord in him. And whenever he's you know, walking off to the side a little bit and you, feel, you uh, sense... The conscience is starting to say, hey, this is, this is not where you want to be. The Spirit of God is saying, beep, beep. You, you know, there's a little warning going off. You come right back over here and walk after the Spirit. Maybe you're, you're like, you said something you shouldn't have said. And it pricks your conscience. And, okay, okay, I'm not going to do that again. I'm, I'm going to... maybe. And if it was something, you destroyed somebody, you go back and you apologize, make it right. No law... I mean, you understand, what, what about the law here? Law cannot even... Law just says, don't kill somebody. <laughs> The Spirit of God is saying, love that man. And then you're walking after the Spirit and you're way above the law. You're way higher than the law ever asked for. So, people that are under works and they think they need to have a, a rule, you know, rules how to live. <laughs> you know? Just walk after the Spirit. Now, people take that. They, I know they run with that. And they say, well, I'm just going to live every, wherever whichever way I want and uh, throw everything out and some, some, maybe sometimes the older need to kind of admonish the younger a little bit. Hey, uh, this, is, this is a little immature over here. Alright. Uh, now, let me go back to James chapter 3 verse so he says there in verse 14, But if you have bitter ending and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Colossians 3, 9, he says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So, lie not against the truth. Now look at verse 15. Here bring, he talks about wisdom again. This wisdom. Now what wisdom is he talking about? He just said, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts. You know, some people, they think they're, they're, they're having wisdom when they have, they're upset at somebody. See, I told that person off. I told him if he doesn't straighten up, you know, and they, and they think they're, they're saying some wise comments about how he dealt with that situation. But he had strife in his heart while he was doing it. But they think that's wisdom. I, I told him, you know. So here it says, this wisdom descendeth not from above. <laughs> you didn't get that wisdom from above. That wisdom was earthly, sensual, devilish. That's the other source of wisdom. You know, isn't that what Adam was tempted with? That he would have wisdom by listening to the devil and eating the fruit. His senses looked at that tree and said, that, that looks like, or this was Eve actually, she was like, that looks like something really good to eat. And if I eat it, it'll give me wisdom. Something that God is withholding from me. And so she gave in to the devil. It was earthly, sensual, devilish. Verse 16, For where envying, you envy somebody? Jealous? Where envying and strife is, fighting, there is confusion and every evil work. Now, can you quote that in the German? Huh? It's different. So, 
<laughs> Isn't that what they quote, but they quote it different? That, that's their page was for having food. Don't they say? Because where there are no rules, they will be for man, tongue is to a full But yeah. <laughs> You guys do have to talk to man. Exactly. And you do have rules. Exactly. Yeah. I was I was thinking. I think there's a German verse that that they quote a lot, so I looked it up. And it didn't say what I used to hear. They usually say where where Ken Ottning is, there's Unatning and Idle Bay is a sting. But that's not what it says. You know, to, to translate what they say in English, to say, well, there are no rules, there's confusion in every evil work. It doesn't say where there's no rule, it says where there is envy and strife. There, that's where the confusion in the every evil work is. So they, they actually miss the real heart of the issue. Let's just slap some rules on that person, and then we'll have order. What's that? Yeah, they, they add to the Word of God. So even in the German, it doesn't say well, Ken Ottning, it says where there's night and tongue, ending and strife. So I don't know where they get... Isn't that weird how you... They take that saying and basically you grow up with that and you build your lives around false statements like that. There's a thing about misquotations. Tell me where the eye has not seen, the tongue has Ears have not heard. So what does the verse underneath say? They skip it. Yeah. Yeah. Another another famous one is uh Blight in Denmark do Gelernet Hash. That's another famous one. Yeah. And if you read that in English, what does it say? Does it say, stay in that which you were taught? It doesn't even say that. It says, keep that which has been committed unto you, right? Yeah. You know, if they, I mean, it's okay to say, if they would actually obey that and keep what Paul taught, that'd be fine. <laughs> you know? But they have... They have listened to, you know, Paul is the pattern. He actually uses the word pattern for himself. He says, I am a pattern for those who would believe. You know what you do with a pattern? You keep that pattern and you use that to mark off the next rafter or whatever you're marking off. But guess what? They threw the pattern away and they used the next rafter and then they marked the next generation and then, then that one marked the next generation. So you're keeping the, the raft or the generation right before you rather than going all the way back to the original pattern. It compounds on the errors. Yeah, the, the errors keep compounding and... and, and uh, the, I've heard mm -hmm. it say over here from um, minister that uh, that's what our beliefs are based on Paul's teaching. That their beliefs are based on Paul's teaching. <laughs> what Paul are you quoting there? Well, I didn't argue. I just I'm going to use scripture or, or, or tradition as a lever, you know, to do whatever they want. Yeah. <clears throat> What's sad is that so many of them, they have all kinds of ending and strife. And they overlook it. They don't even, I mean, I grew up, we did it all the time. We'd come home from school and we'd talk about it and the neighbor's kids, what they did at school. And, and, I, and, I, and then parents would respond and that's just terrible and that's unfair and whatever. And they'd make fun of us and we'd make fun of them. And, and we'd just have all kinds of evil work stirred up in our hearts, ending and strife. And nobody ever told us we shouldn't do that. We'd get, I mean, I'd get so stirred up and upset at neighbors, I, f I felt like going over and start destroying someone. Um, you know, nobody told us gossiping is a sin and talking evil about somebody is a sin. 
yet we looked just fine. We were some of the most conservative, we were the most conservative Amish in the whole area. Lost as a goose. <laughs> Uh, verse 17 but the wisdom so here's the opposite so here's, you see the two sources of wisdom this goes right back to what he said in chapter 1 about not being double minded if you're double minded you're unstable in all your ways he said but the wisdom that is from above you see where the source is it's not on the earth it's from above it's from heaven is first pure my, my, so different. Beautiful, pure, then peaceable. Doesn't have all that strife in it. It's peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. In other words, you can, you can talk to a guy and he's approachable. He can, he's easy to listen to. He's ready to listen to you. And, and if you have a valid point, say, okay, I see what you're saying. He's easily to be entreated. He doesn't say, well, we've always been doing it this way and there's nothing, we, we're not going to change. Easily to be, to be entreated, full of mercy, full of mercy and good fruits. Man, if we had leaders like that, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, not treating one different from another, and without hypocrisy. Boy, that covers it. No... <clears throat> No putting on a show that's not true inside of you. Not acting different outside than what's in your heart. Now that is beautiful wisdom. You cannot come up with this wisdom on your own. This, this wisdom is so good, no wonder he says it's from above. This is God's wisdom. That's the way He is. Can you see that? That's the way God is. Remember it says every perfect gift Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Well, here we, here's the word above again. Chapter 3 is, you know, connects back all the way to chapter 1. It's beautiful. Mm. Last verse. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You see, it's the opposite of strife. It's to make peace. You see strife in the church or strife between you and a brother? Try to make peace. And if you make peace, you are sowing fruits of righteousness. Fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Of those people that make peace, the fruit of righteousness is sown. And you're going to reap from that. Rather than starting a big fire, destroying the whole church, make peace. All right. <clears throat> that deals with the heart. Now that we're Christians, we're brothers and sisters, let's act like it. Now that we're saved, let's count it all joy. When your, when your faith gets tried and you fall into diverse temptations, brother says something evil about you. Or something goes wrong, <clears throat> get mistreated. Don't respond in bitterness and in strife. Be slow to speak. Let, let yourself cool down before you speak. Slow to wrath. And Because if you give in to the, the lust of the flesh and get into wrath and strife, you're not going to have the presence of mind, you're not going to have the clearness of thought to receive wisdom how to deal with the issue. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, it says. If you're double-minded, you give in to the lust of the flesh, the, the, the stirrings going on inside the flesh. Anything else? Got time, I think, right? A little bit shorter chapter. But does that threaten your salvation to talk about it like this? No, no. You? Yeah. You see, you go back to chapter 2, verse 22. Seest, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. If you would respond like this, it 
somehow I guess it perfects your faith. Your faith comes to its full form when you respond correctly to the issues, the trials, the temptations, and you let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect in entire, wanting nothing. And so like Abraham, when he was tried, his faith was tried, and he responded correctly and worked. He did a work, offered, his, offered up his son Isaac, and that work was a demonstration of his faith, an expression of his faith, and worked with his faith. And so, by works was faith made perfect. That faith that you got the moment you were saved is now on a path to getting perfect based on how you act and what you say, how you react to life and the things going on. And then in verse 23, and the Scripture was fulfilled. Fulfilled. All right, that's, that's so beautiful. Notice it does not say, and then God said, you're, you're righteous. It doesn't, see, God did not come to Abraham and say, okay, I'm not going to call you righteous because you offered up your son. No, he's been calling him righteous way back here in the beginning. And I think it was in uh, Genesis 15 or somewhere in there. He said, you're the father of many nations. He believed God and God uh, imputed that, uh, called that faith righteous. He looked at Abraham and said, you're the righteousness of God. I mean, you're, you're perfectly righteous. Hadn't done a single work. Now his faith is getting tried, right? The next day, he still doesn't see a fulfillment of the promise of God. What's he supposed to do? Yield to the, the circumstances of his life? Or is he going to just believe all over again? There's no room to just let faith stay in a neutral ground. If you're just going to try to put faith in cruise control, well, I'm just going to float. I'm just going to float from now on. I'm saved. I'm just going to float down the river from now on. Can't do that. The very next day, something's going to challenge that faith. We're going to have to take a stand and let patience have its perfect work. And you grow up. Faith is constantly being challenged. So that makes, I mean, I don't know if you're getting what I'm trying to say. If, in other words, if you would just let go of it, you'd lose it. There's no standing still. Yeah, there's no standing still. So it's almost like you have to work to keep your faith, if that makes sense. Faith has to now be expressed in works. Right? Somebody does something wrong to you, what are you going to do? Are you just going to let the flesh make you angry? Are you going to believe that that flesh is crucified? Believe God and walk and respond. Let patience have its perfect work and ask for wisdom how to deal with it. See, you're, you're doing something now. You're, that faith is now expressing itself and causing you to act in a certain way, a different way than you used to. And you didn't even think about it. Am I working now? No, it's just, I'm a Christian now and I'm supposed to act like one and I'm going to respond different. And... 40 years later, when Abraham did that, it says, and the Scripture was fulfilled, which said, you're righteous. Fulfilled. That's awesome. I like James is not contradicting Romans. James is not contradicting this imputed righteousness by faith. That faith grows until it reaches its full fruition, its full form. And then it fulfills that position that you got that first moment that you got saved. It actually kind of go with Romans like 12. Yeah. Where it says to your body and you mm -hmm. There you go. The body, offering a body. Yeah, that's awesome. I think the best is actually quite kind of Yeah. Oh my. You know, I can see a big difference in somebody just by what they say, what they used to say, what they say now. Mm -hmm. It changes the whole thing. It changes the 
small game. You, I, I still remember, you know, some, probably some of these people in here. In here? Yeah. <clears throat> Myself included, you know. <laughs> How, you know a person is changed by what comes out of Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about Rahab again today and how she was believing that the uh, Israelites were going to totally destroy their city. And so she acted accordingly. She acted in a way that expressed that faith. She helped the spies. And I was thinking, how would that apply today? I, I talked a little bit about that last week, but you know, everything in this world is going to burn up one day, uh, and including all the institutions, all the church houses, all the banks where you put your money in and operate it, this whole system, all the institutions, the systems, the churches, the unsaved, you know, everybody that's not saved, all this stuff's going to burn up. Now, if you believe that, you're not going to put faith in any of this stuff. You're not going to trust a church, you're not going to trust a man, you're not going to trust an institution or a system. You're going to believe these spies. You're going to believe these messengers that are coming and pro uh, proclaiming a message that is of another, another kingdom, an invisible kingdom, another, another group. Another world is going to come and overtake this world. Do you want to be part of that? Or do you, or you want to go down with this thing that's getting destroyed? Which side are you going to pick? Well, I want to go with that side. Well, then you're going to have to face the rejection and the uh, uh, ostracized, you know, being ostracized and rejected by these people over here and start living according to that kingdom. You know? And if you believe that, this kingdom, this world's going down, she expressed that in how she treated those messengers, those sp spies. She put the cord out and trusted that they're going to save her and her family. Or what, you know, whatever they said you must do, then do that. And she did it. And she was saved from going down. What color that cord was? <clears throat> Scarlet, right? Red. Red. She told the spies to hide in the mountains for three days. Mm -hmm. Three days, yeah. It's three days, red, yeah. <laughs> but I'm reminded of uh, Pilgrim's Progress. You ever read that? How this pilgrim, he suddenly became aware that his city is going to burn up. He started getting really worried about it. Oh, everybody around him was just carrying on like nothing's wrong, nothing's going to happen, everything's fine. But he got so burdened with fear and like wondering how to escape the city that's going to burn up. Yeah. All of us, we have to come to that place where we realize everything's going to burn up. We have to, we've, we have to find a way of escape. And you have to start putting your faith in a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, to escape the coming destruction. And that faith will express itself. Just will. We know that there's a film of progress in the most popular book ever. Well, the Bible had it so more copies than the film of progress in the second. Abraham Lincoln had studied. He studied Pilgrim's Progress. He plowed and he was always plowed as a kid. Oh, yeah? That's awesome. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I've heard that book is the second best-selling book beside after the Bible. Hmm? Yeah, back in back in the day. There's one out that's got pictures in it. Very old and I've gone in a friend's house. I borrowed. I mean, I had to get more packed up to get it. I mean, they had a lot of the pictures. There's also an audio where they, they kind of acted out and you hear swords clinging and clanging and it's not a DVD though. No, it's just it. CDs, you know. Yeah. You can listen. Kind of like Pearl's book on good and evil. Yeah, but it's all audio. <clears throat> so it's dramatized in audio. 
pretty cool. But that, you know the author was in prison when he wrote that. The author of that book was in prison. 12 years in prison. It's encouraging to think that even though you're in prison, you can bless generations and generations of people. If you... Yeah, somewhere back, way back there, yeah. I don't remember the exact time, but... I listened to his story. Somebody studied his life and, and then just talked about it. And pretty interesting how he, he would struggle with assurance of salvation and, and then all of a sudden he would just get the revelation that Christ is my righteousness. And I don't need any righteousness. He is my righteousness. And even if I sin, that doesn't change the fact that He is my righteousness. And he just set his conscience free again. He'd walk, walk in freedom and start teaching the Word. And people loved to listen to him because he was so down to earth and practical. And, and they'd arrest him and get out again and arrest him again. I think it's kind of cool that Sea World way back then. The what? I think it's kind of cool that Sea World way back then. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And it says that every.